Welcome to our live stream. I'm very pleased today to introduce to all of you two special guest artists, Mary Kwan and also Lauren Levette. Today, we are talking about racism that occurs in art schools. And Mary and Lauren will be speaking from their own experiences as students at the Rhode Island School of Design. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. I wanna introduce you guys to Mary and Lauren, let you know where they're coming from. But before we do that, I do want you to know that we have a trigger warning for this video because we are going to be speaking about topics related to racism and sexual harassment. So I would just be conscious of that if you decide to continue watching. Now, Mary is an interdisciplinary artist and she's also a writer and an activist. She finished her BFA in painting at RISD. And currently Mary is a master's in art education student where their research is on the intersection of domestic violence and higher arts education. And Lauren is a rising senior doing their BFA in painting at RISD. And Lauren's studio practice is about the beautiful and chaotic nature of black everyday life. Now, I got to know Mary and Lauren because Mary and Lauren are currently a part of this RISD anti-racism coalition, which was initially started by RISD students Jada Okoto and Sarah Alvarez. And Mary and Lauren actually spoke on this RISD and race panel, which you guys can watch yourselves. The Vimeo link is in the video description below. And so that's how these conversations about racism in art school started to come up with Mary and Lauren. Now, Mary and Lauren, I know that for a lot of people, one of the most visible examples of racism in art school oftentimes happens in the classroom, particularly at RISD where group critiques are a major part of your experience as a student. And I know as people of color that the group critiques can be extremely frustrating. Now, Lauren, how has that been the case for you? Why have the group critiques been really tough for you? I think definitely the group critiques are very directed when you're not a white um, cis artist. Uh, they're definitely based around uh, the way you look or present yourself, your identity. And so a lot of the times it there's an awkward environment um, in like describing the work. Uh, I definitely feel like there's a sense of uh, feeling stuck for a lot of students of color where they feel like they walk away not really uh, getting very useful information with their work. They're not really sure how to improve. Um, so I definitely think that's a huge obstacle for students of color in the crit space. And that's so frustrating because that's the whole point of a group critique exactly. is to be given substantial information that tells you how to proceed how to improve your work. And really, I think sometimes it's that silence that is so much more hurtful than any type of commentary. Mary, have you experienced that, that just deafening silence when you show your work and critique? I think that mostly black and brown students experience that the most. Um, for myself, it happens most when I present uh, material that people aren't ready to engage with. They don't feel like they are trained to engage with it. And so being scared makes them not want to say anything. But um, in my thesis, Sky talks about this a lot, Sky Vollmer. And in terms of like a lot of people uh, project things onto your work when you're a person of color. And they assume that like your work should be like, if you're a person of color, is about race. And so there's no real way to escape race. Um, no matter how hard you try, people constantly project those things onto you. Um, and it is very limiting because people of color are not just their race. That is a huge part of who we are. That is the center of who we are in many cases. But 
um, is definitely, definitely very limiting. Um, and you don't get that much out of critique when it's like that. And Lauren, what types of comments or reactions have people actually said about your artwork that you really felt that, wow, they are not understanding or even trying to understand it? Yeah, I definitely feel like I have uh, heard comments that were very racially charged, I feel. Um, I've gotten like demonic or violent. I remember uh, being compared to like a rap producer um, in my work which I wasn't quite sure exactly what I, that meant, but I didn't really hear other students receiving any sort of critique remotely like that. Um, I've also been told that there's no room for like identity art in certain spaces, um, whatever that means. Um, yeah, what so is identity art? What were, were they, did they define that for you? It just seems like such a weird phrase in it's my a opinion. A statement. Um, it's just like, I think it just refers to art that isn't like white or made by white artists. I don't think I would have gotten the same um, label if I was uh, an artist of color or if I wasn't an artist of color. I mean, it seems to me that what does happen when people don't know how to react is oftentimes they impose a narrative on your work that just is not there. I mean, have people done that in the past with your work, Mary, where they just have said, oh, it's about this, this, and this. And you're like, uh-uh, <laughs> like, has that happened? Yeah, I think that being a white art school, like you're ready to, you kind of see yourself through white eyes and you anticipate this harm. And I felt like whenever I made like work, like a self portrait of myself, like it was automatically a conversation about like, Asian women being fetishized. And that was a conversation I did not want to be a part of. And I really stopped painting myself because I didn't want that to be the conversation around my work. I didn't want to be talking about the harm that was done on my body and other bodies like mine. Um, but yeah, I think that like you learn how to avoid those conversations that you don't want to have. And that changes your all your work when you go to art school. Like it isn't it, you you change it so you avoid this harm. Right, and it's very tricky because if you think about somebody who's at art school, it doesn't matter who they are, their background, just the average art school student, you're there to learn and you're also in a somewhat vulnerable position because it's so early in your career, you don't have the professional experience or even the technical experience a lot of the times. And so these group critiques that you have and the way your work is received by people at art school is incredibly impactful. How can you not take those comments to heart and have them impact your artistic practice? And I know for a lot of students, pretty much everyone across the board, I think has a lot of self doubt when you're in art school, you're just always questioning, what am I doing and what am I doing next? But it seems to me from these discussions that that self doubt really gnaws at you over time when you're a person of color. Has that been the case for you, Lauren? Yeah, um, I think these feelings of like, I know for a little bit I was making abstract work um, and I brought abstract paintings to my class and I noticed um, when my classmates like, re I guess, responded to the abstract work, they had more to say than uh, when I made figurative work, but it didn't feel right because uh, I, it just wasn't work that I wanted to make. It, it felt like I needed to fit in more with my, um, I guess with my class rather than making work that was true to me and true to what I wanted to say. We have a comment here from Angie S. They are saying, how do you respond to such ignorant comments? I can't imagine being subjected to that kind of uncomfortable situation. That's why I've avoided Jewish subjects. Well, what do you say to that, Mary? Um, I say that you really just have to have boundaries between yourself and white people. Uh, how you think about yourself is not the same way that white people look at you. And it shouldn't be the way that white people look at you or like, people who are anti-Semitic or anti-anything. It's like you you have to like have your own vision, have that core self, believe in yourself. Um, you have to, like, I honestly feel bad for people who have this much hate and are so 
trapped under this illusion of hate and racism. And they are missing out on a great world. And I would just say that you have to like live your truth and your honesty will will spread to everybody. And honestly, um, it is worth the risk, you know? Well, and also we've seen Mary and Lauren that through your activism, that this is really almost become part of your practice in a way, because I think one of the, well, I don't wouldn't say it's a consequence, but because you are having these kinds of experiences, you are, you have become activists for that reason. And the consequence though is that it does take away from your time, right? Because it's like you're, you're spending time being an art school student, first of all, making the work, but now you're finding that you have to do this extra layer of advocacy to make a place for yourselves. How does that function with your studio practice and just being an art school student, Lauren? Um, it definitely is uh, a, a lot tougher because you have to a lot more time to feel like, um, you just feel as a person of color, you feel obligated to represent your community since there's not many people who look like you there. Um, and so, in a way, you also feel obligated to make that space for them. And um, while that's important work that needs to be done, it's also very taxing in relation to making work in art school where you're constantly, um, you know, you constantly have to use intellectual work to uh, produce your work or produce your art. And um, it's just tough trying to find that balance between the two. We have a comment here from Ali. They're saying, I'm so angry anyone deals with that in a space that should be safe for open and honest conversations. That's what I think makes it hurt more is that the expectation is that a classroom in an educational situation is intended to nurture and encourage and support that artistic expression. And when you enter that space and you get the opposite experience, it's really, really hard and it grates on you after a while. So Mary, can you talk about the role of your professors in all of this? Because we've talked about the reaction that you're getting from the work, but the thing is the professor really occupies a different place than the students. For example, I taught at RISD for a very, very long time. And I oftentimes had to be the person that said the really uncomfortable thing, the elephant in the room that the other students were really nervous to talk about it. They didn't really want to address it. And so I'd come out and say like, okay, let's just lay this out. Let's talk about it. But not everybody does that. So what's it been for you, the experience with the professors in these situations, Mary? Um, you know, most of the professors at my art school are white. And so there's this common saying when you come into RISD, they say, we're going to uh, tear you down to build you back up. And when that happens to students of color with mostly predominantly white professors, they tear you down and build you up as a white version of yourself. Um, when you are in critiques and they are determining your grade, you want to like accommodate for their point of view or else you're going to fail the class. And so oftentimes you get affirmation for work that you wouldn't want to make. And I would say by the end of my time at RISD, I got a lot of affirmation for my work, but I didn't recognize it at the end. And so I kind of like threw out all that work because I was like, the the things that people are like wanting me to make are white things and those aren't me. Exactly. And, and that feels almost like a betrayal of who you are, but I completely understand that reaction. And we know, I think Lauren, you had mentioned to me that actually a lot of students who are people of color after graduation really have trouble making their studio practice and keeping it alive because of all of these circumstances. Why do you think that is? I mean, what, what perpetuates that? There's this sense of um, constant work culture that's like really implemented in art school where you feel like, um, well, one, you have all your studio classes in a week. So you have to constantly make work um, every week. You have to make something new. Um, and since you want a good grade, there's that sense of affirmation that you have to live up to. And so for students of color, there's an extra um, expectation that we have to meet in order to meet our um, 
white counterparts uh, to be able to get the gray that we want and then to also be able to uh, improve in the way that we want to. But unfortunately, there's that sense of burnout that comes afterwards because we're constantly making work. Um, and then there's a sense of guilt that follows that because when you graduate, you don't have those resources and you don't have the studio space to keep uh, creating. And so you're wondering, well, what's next since I don't have this structure anymore? Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up something about the whole grading issue because it's true when you're a student in a class and you have a professor you do worry about your grade and how you're being perceived and i know that when i was teaching at RISD it was very common for a lot of students in my class they would come to my ta my teaching assistant they would say so what kind of artwork does clara like what type of work should i make that clara would be impressed by that will get me a good grade and I don't think it should be that way at all <laughs> because I'm like, first of all, you guys don't know what I like. Second of all, you're probably wrong. Oftentimes I like stuff and people are like, really? I'm like, yes, you can't really tell. And also why are you trying to satisfy one person on the planet when really the person you should be trying to satisfy is yourself. And so I know how common that is to really feel as an art school student that you really have to mold yourself into the professor's expectations. And so when you are not getting support for the work that you're making, it's very, very hard to assert yourself because then you worry, oh no, I'm not gonna do well in this class because I'm not doing a good job of that. We have another comment here from Pagarami. They're saying, I've had firsthand experiences with racism when I've gone to the US one of the things I fear the most about my possible future in university, do you guys think most minorities have to go through the same? Mary, why don't you take on that question? Yeah, I think that as a person with, a, um, with immigrant parents, as a first generation American, um, a lot of people describe racism as the American dream tax. It's just something that you have to pay when you come here. Um, and racism does happen all the time for minorities, especially those who are immigrating. Uh, there's a huge divide between um, domestic people of color and international people of color. And I think that um, it is just important to move with love rather than fear. Don't let um, your fear of racism stop you from doing the things that you want to do. Um, that is another like consequence of racism, and that is another consequence that you you can try to resist, and you will find people who want to resist with you, and you will find community. Yeah. We have a question from Geekles. How as a white artist can I be a better ally and better critic in regards to artists of color in the classroom? I'm a high school student in a predominantly white school looking to attend art school. Great question. What would you say to that, Lauren? I would say. Um, the first things that you have to recognize is your privilege um, and the way that you may move is not the same way a lot of other people move about art school. Um, and so some people just have an easier time than others because of um, just the expectations that are put in place uh, for these schools. And so basically um, just being able to be aware of that first and foremost um, if you hear something that may not be right in the class, I think because of a lot of uh, these people or these uh, students of color face um, silence or very uh, off color, odd remarks, um, it's important to speak up and let people know that like you are their ally. Um, and also being able to do the research and uh, look at more people of color artists and see how they're portraying themselves versus the way um, art history uh, and Western European artists have portrayed them um, is very important, yeah. Yeah, I would well, also add that um, that you really gotta be an active bystander. You gotta like realize that um, especially black and indigenous people are always in the line of fire. If you get caught in the crossfire now and then, that is a privilege that you're not constantly like, and like you aren't constantly the target. And so inserting yourself into those circumstances of racism is really important. And honestly, you will get great friends 
by by like making sure that people know that you're an ally, like people will love you. And you shouldn't do it so you have clout or love, but you should do it because like, if you don't do it, people of color are going to do it and people of color are going to continue to be harmed. Yeah, and I think that one thing that we have noticed is racial gaslighting, especially when it comes to professors and inappropriate behavior. So Lauren, can you explain for everybody what racial gaslighting is? Um, so racial gaslighting occurs when um, something happens to a person of color and they may tell some, somebody about it or um, they may speak up about saying like, hey, this is racist um, or this is like, this is offensive. And people immediately uh, say, um, well, are you sure about that? Or they deny that experience rather than listening to what that person is saying. Yeah, and it's even worse because I think number one, to speak out about a professor's poor behavior, you're already walking a plank just by saying that out loud. But then when people come in and they say things like, well, I don't think that that professor would ever say something like that. Or they say, well, every time I spoke to that professor, they were always very nice. And I can't imagine that they would ever say something like that. It's like, yeah, that's the way they behave when they were around you. That doesn't mean that they speak to everybody on the planet like that. You can't make that assumption. And so I think what ends up happening is it's extremely harmful because it makes people feel that, wow, if I reach out for help, this is actually gonna make it worse. Does that happen, Mary? Have you seen that? Yeah, um, in a lot of cases, I also don't want to make people feel like they can't reach out for help, but the most help that you can find is in your community, not in like Title IX, which is uh, where you go for harassment and racism and stuff. Um, oftentimes students in our schools who reach out um, are gaslighted, they are denied their re reality, they are criticized for reaching out for help, and oftentimes it requires like a process that is very, very taxing on the student, it continues to take more from them. And it really puts your body and your mind and your work and your spirit on the line. And I think that a lot of students who reach out actually get a lot more harm. And it's very, very sad because um, that should not be happening. There should be safe people to reach out to in art schools if you need help. Um, but I would say definitely find help in community first and um, don't make it urgent, work slow, make sure that you're okay first. And um, yeah, nobody deserves that kind of treatment. We have a comment here from Traha Pace. My professors wanted me to make work, quote, blacker and my classmates tune out whenever I did mention, I think there's a little bit of a typo in there. What does that mean to make your work blacker, as they're saying? I mean, some of these phrases, I'm like, who, do, who comes up with these phrases? I mean, have you, Lauren, seen these strange terms that people use to describe your work? Yeah, uh, I've definitely gotten like violent and like urban, um, and so, uh, what that eventually made me realize was a lot of people in my classes and my school didn't really understand my experience. And so it made me wonder like, why should I really make work that appeals to what they want um, besides for a grade, but how does that serve me after this class? Um, I just eventually let go of whatever uh, stereotypes it seemed that my, um, classes or my professors projected on me. Uh, and I feel like that really helped me flourish and, and make the work that I wanna make that I feel fulfilled making. And you guys here watching the stream, we're looking at Lauren's work right now. And it's like, really, Urban? <laughs> Is that the <laughs> takeaway? Like, are we looking at the same images? It's, it's really, really frustrating. We have a question here from Nobert. They're saying, how should professors address the equality of intelligence between teachers and student bodies? It does seem teachers are intending to quote, teach too much, thus affirming the hierarchy in the classroom. Mary, what's your reaction to that comment? I love that comment. Um, I just think that a lot of professors have this idea that students, especially students of color, 
come in as like empty cups that they have to fill up. In reality, like no matter what age you are, you come with like completely different experiences, especially if you have a white professor and you're a person of color. You both have two different realities and you have a lot to learn from each other. And to assume that a person of color, a student of color, doesn't have as much intelligence as you, you are completely wrong. They are so smart and like they are, they know the underbelly of this country. They know how racism works. They know. And it's just like, to break down that hierarchy, you really have to create a co-collaborative class where you work with the students to figure out what they really want to do and meet them where they are and be open to being wrong and be open to learning. Don't ask them to teach you, though, but also just work with them. Treat them like humans. Um, don't assume that they're dumb or unintelligent or uneducated. A lot of these students are incredibly intelligent. I mean, I have to say, as a professor, it is not easy to talk about racism in a classroom or about these tougher topics, but you have to. You can't just ignore it and hope that it goes away. And the thing is, I would never make the assumption that I somehow have to teach people about racism. I think if anything, it's the opposite. I feel like I should be listening to everybody around me and absorbing that because I think this idea of teaching racism to people because I'm the professor, that doesn't make any sense to me. And so I think what you're talking about, Mary, is that really it's a dialogue where we all bring our experiences to the table and I am not above you because I'm the professor. I'm just another person who's part of the conversation. And so I wonder if maybe that's why sometimes people just don't even wanna go there. Like professors, I think a lot of the times they'd much rather just not say anything because it's easier. They don't have to be held accountable for what they say, but this is stuff that we need to talk about. Like Sherry M is saying, thank you for speaking on this topic. And we have a comment from Yo, can't pronounce her name, Swan, Sharon, gaslighting is so often, and it happened often with many interactions I had with some friends. It's really frustrating, yes. So let's talk a little bit, Mary, about your master's project. So this is a project that you're working on that is exploring the intersection of domestic violence and higher arts education. So can you tell us briefly what that project is about? Yeah, I didn't write anything out to describe it, so I'm gonna just tell you guys a little casual description of it. Um, I've been working on this thesis for this past year. It was inspired by me watching a lot of mostly uh, queer femmes of color around me, like myself, um, be in a relationship to this, to this art school that is very abusive. And as a person who has worked in domestic violence shelters, I realized that a lot of the terms that we can apply to abusive partners, we can actually apply to our art schools. Um, and so this thesis kind of like goes through the abusive tactics the, the art school uses to force onto the students and the consequences of that, but also half of this, this thesis is actually about healing from this relationship, what you do after this relationship. And this is actually a, a short quote from one of the oral histories I did with one of my good friends, Sky Volmar. Um, and in this quote from my talk with her, she says, a room of presumption looks like everyone's assumptions about my racial identity and its influence in my work. Everything I made was some sort of discursive commentary on race, regardless of what I said or did. It didn't matter what I set out to make. Um, I got the message that a Black person couldn't make a painting of a Black person without engaging with a Black body politic. I got the message that only the only work I could, should, and was capable of making was about race. And so um, this thesis really goes into, I think, seven to eight uh, two-hour oral histories with people who are um, people of color, uh, trans, queer, non-binary, and um, mostly femmes. And it's really about like um, this relationship that these people have with this institution and how to lead this relationship. Um, I don't tolerate abuse in any capacity and certainly not from art school. You know, it's very interesting, Mary, when we first started talking about this, when you brought up your master's project, 
it was so uncanny the way that you talked about it because I thought, oh my goodness, I have been describing my relationship as a professor with RISD as basically my abusive partner. And it really felt that way because for years, I mean, I was at RISD for 14 years. Every year I said, that's it. I can't do this anymore. This is eating me alive from the inside. I am done, I'm walking away. But then something would happen. I'd say, no, 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 just to stick it out just a little bit more, maybe this will happen. And then I go crawling back. I'm on my hands and knees again, begging to be taken back. And it's this emotional roller coaster that you start to ride where you experience these almost mood swings of this relationship. I mean, Lauren, what's your thought about this um, intersection of domestic violence and higher arts ed? Yeah, I think especially with um, like this sense of feeling that you're not good enough, you always feel as a person of color in this space that you're not good enough to be there. Um, and it's through maybe subtle ways, it's also through this racial gaslighting and denying of your experience um, that you feel like, well, okay, well maybe I can just keep going. Um, maybe I'm just, you know, being, I guess, not, uh, maybe I'm just not strong enough. I just need to keep going, I need to get better. Um, and you're not given this space to really rest and figure out, okay, well, um, you know, you don't really feel like, um, I don't know, there's always this sense that you don't belong, um, which really needs to begin to change if we're going to begin to be more welcoming and uh, actually present a safe space for art students of color to make their work. Yeah, we have a comment like, here. Go ahead. I yeah, I feel like you always have to prove your worth, prove that you are worthy of love or value when everybody's of value. And when you encourage people from love, then people really flourish. And yeah, with RISDs, like they always, I, or any art school, they like tell you like, I'll change, like I'll change. We won't be racist anymore. Um, we have seen throughout the decades the entire history of most art schools, they have not changed. They are abusive partner that will never change. And my position is that um, a lot of people who are people of color should leave these relationships to these white art schools. And I can say, I mean, I'm much older than you guys. <laughs> I've been around longer and I have seen schools cycle through those same hollow statements. Yep we know we're gonna change, we hear your voices loud and clear. And then a few years later, those students who were creating that movement graduate. And then all of a sudden we need another round of students who are still in the school to advocate again from scratch. And you know something, a lot of the things people are asking for the exact same thing. It's not a different set of issues. It's the same thing every single time it comes up. We have a comment here from Tishan. They are saying, I think in art school, there's a serious lack of introducing and exposing students to artists of color throughout history, which creates a racial bias perception of what is art and how it should look. Now, Mary, what is your feeling about the way art history is taught in art school? Because art history is in most art schools, a requirement, you have to take it. And it's not the most diverse, range of faculty, I can say that. What's it like? How is it taught at art school? Um, frankly, it's very boring. Um, there's a lot of mostly just white artists that I don't care about. And I spent so many years trying to love them, but I don't really care about them as much as artists of color, if I'm being honest. And so most of my art education was actually from my community of like other people of color. And we we're trying to teach each other about um, other artists of color. And we really taught each other and we learned together and our professors didn't really teach us much. Lauren, was that your experience as well? I agree. I think it was up to us as the students to figure out um, maybe once in a while I would have um, a art or a, a teacher of color show us um, like Kehinde Wiley or Carrie James Marshall, but um, 
honestly, I didn't really have much um, education from my school. It was really up to me to find artists of color who inspired me. I felt like in a lot of class discussions, um, we would be talking about very classical artists um, instead of contemporary artists today. And I just felt really bored and I, I felt guilty for being bored because I didn't really hear about artists who looked like me. I felt like artists that I've, like I've heard these artists' names over and over again. Um, and I just wanted to find something else to, to talk about in class. But at the same time, I felt like, well, if I'm not interested, like, am I not smart enough? But I don't think that's the case. I think in a lot of these schools, it's a universal um, sort of foundation that's taught that's based on Western and European art. And there's only a sliver of artists of color uh, that are mentioned in there. Yeah, when I did art history class as an art school student in the 90s, I cannot believe this, but it just never occurred to me that, wow, according to the art history curriculum, Africa, South America, and Asia don't exist. It's all about Europe and Northern America. And it really was not until fairly recently that I realized, you know, that's really messed up. And the fact that I didn't even think about that is even worse. And so I think that it's extremely frustrating because when you do talk about people of color, artists in contemporary art and history, what, what do they get? Like a paragraph? And then there's like a whole section on Northern European Dutch still life painting. Did you ever see that, Mary? Yeah, um, it really reminds, it's, it's, it's kind of performative in a lot of ways. They just, it's like a checkbox for them. Um, they're like, if I include at least one woman or one person of color, then I'm done. I did my work. But in reality, like, I really think that, uh, like, women and femmes of color make, like, the most incredible work. I've become, like, so disinterested in work that is supposed to be interesting. I'm interested in work that is liberating. I'm not interested in falling deeper into the illusion of, like, white supremacy and racism. I'm interested in, like, really freeing myself and seeing the world in a different way. And a lot of, like, people of color and women see the world in that way. We have a comment here from Angie. They're saying, my art history classes focus mostly on Rembrandt and the Renaissance, all men, no women, people of color. I didn't even know women of color created art until I got out of art school. Yeah, and I think what you said earlier, Mary, about artists that look like you, I think that also very much extends to your professors. So Lauren, you're a rising senior. You've been at art school for a little while. I'm going to guess you had at least three or four professors a semester. How many people of color were your professors at your time at art school? I've only had one professor of color. Um, of all three years that I've been here, I've only had one. Um, and it's so disappointing because I feel like uh, there's so many people who could be coming in here, um, or it, it just feels like uh, I don't see as many artists who look like me, and it kind of still inst uh, it instills that sense of self doubt um, that, well, am I going to make it as an artist? Because I don't see um, many people who are from my background who are pursuing the same path. So, is it possible for me too? And Mary, how about you? How many people of color have you had as professors? Uh, I think I've had two studio uh, studio teachers, professors who are people of color out of my five years at RISD. And I think I maybe had one or two like art history, liberal arts teachers, um, but not many at all. And my favorite teacher was like a woman of color. She was black and her name is Jennifer Packer. She's really amazing. And it's like, that was like one of my best and like only classes I've ever learned from at RISD to be honest. Yeah, and I'll tell you when I announced fairly recently that I had decided to leave RISD and academia after 14 really difficult years, a lot of my students when they heard about it and because I was talking about my experience as a woman of color, 
being part-time for 14 years, I applied to so many full-time positions across all these different schools. Not once did I ever make it past the first round. And most of the time, the people they hired was a white guy. And I was like, you cannot tell me that this is an issue of, oh, there aren't enough candidates or, oh, it's because you're not good enough. I'm like, I don't think that's a coincidence at all. And so a lot of students said to me, you know what, Clara, you were the only person of color professor I had in my four years at art school. And for them, it was this surprise. Again, like the art history where you just sort of accept it because it's quote normal. But then when you step back, you realize, you know what, that is really not cool that it's like that. Because I think Lauren, what you said earlier about being able to visualize your future is so important. And I had a student write to me on Instagram. They said, you were the first teacher who looked like me. And I thought, I'm glad I can be that person for you, but I should not be the only one who you see that way. I should be one of many people that you see. Really, really important to talk about that. Now let's talk about schools as institutions. We're talking lately about our own interactions, but I think there's also something to be said about the school as an institution and how schools are trying to make efforts to address these needs because a lot of students now are becoming very vocal, which is excellent and necessary. But then what I've seen a lot is a lot of these empty promises, this facade of we are advocates for social justice and we are advocating for people of color. What do you say to those responses, Lauren, from what you've seen? Um, I just say that it's an ongoing conversation. It shouldn't be just one statement. And then we they put in, you know, some minimal effort. And then once the issue around race seems to die down, um, then everything goes back to normal because um, those experiences don't those experiences don't go away for artists of color, and it's important that we keep figuring out well how do we begin to dismantle these systems that continue to oppress um, people who are still here, people who still take up space at the school and exist. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would also add to that that like these art schools, these liberal schools love it when um, students of color call out racism and make social justice artwork. It looks good on the brochures, but when students call out racism in the institution that they are experiencing, people get really defensive. People create a lot of harm. People lash out, and it's actually quite scary. And um, I think that it's like a false idea that this school is liberal and welcomes like social justice. People aren't prepared to talk about racism or any other forms of oppression. And they will project whatever they feel onto you. And that's harm. Yeah. And I think so much of it is about schools trying to save face. They print some big brochure <laughs> that talks about equity and inclusion and all of these buzzwords to show that they're doing something. I'm like, I don't care how big your brochure is if you guys can't really get down to it. No amount of brochure printing is gonna fix this. And the reason I know this is because there was an instance, and I talked about this in my Instagram post a little ways back, that there was demand among students a couple of years ago for visibility and schools really starting to address that. And I went to my department head and I said, listen, I'm one of the very few women of color who's on this campus. What can I do to help address these student needs? And the department head said, oh, this is what I said first, actually. I said, listen, I have this course. I've been trying to get it to run for a long time because every year I'd propose it to the curriculum and it was called personal narratives and drawing. And what I wanted to do was give students a place to explore their personal experiences, which inevitably is gonna talk about race and identity and gender. And I wanted to really push that. And the department had said to me, well, we already have two classes that address those comments, those topics. And I said, yeah, they're taught by two white men. You really think that that's sufficient? And so when you have people who are of color on campus as faculty actively saying, what can I do to help? And you're saying, that's okay, the white men have it covered. 
you've got a problem as an institution. It's extremely frustrating. And the other thing I've seen too is that a lot of people, their Band-Aid fix is read a book. Here, faculty, this is a book about racism. Read this. I mean, Lauren, does that fix it? It doesn't fix it until you meet people who are actually going through it. Um, there's so many professors that are actively saying, like um, professors of color who are doing the work to have to, uh, and overworking, um, extending more than they need to be, uh, to be helping these students because um, a lot of the time, uh, these professors who do read the books or who do do research but don't actually take into account the real experiences that we have, um, they just tend to gloss over it. And they're like, well, I mean, I researched this and this, but it's like, have you listened to somebody? That research might instruct you about history and things that have happened, but until you've talked to somebody who really can share what's happened to them, it's not really real. And I know this because sometimes, for example, I'm reading the newspaper and I'll, I'll read about these issues and experiences that people are having. And for many, many years, I taught at RISD Project Open Door, which is a free program. It's for urban teens that are underserved in Rhode Island. And it was one of my absolute favorite things about teaching because I knew I was teaching kids who normally would never have access to that kind of education. And I mean, I would talk to kids in that class and they'd say things to me like, I'm worried my mother's gonna get deported. And when you hear that coming from somebody who's in your class, that impacts you, absolutely. So when I hear faculty, read this book, we're gonna organize this workshop and we're gonna bring in a white man to teach you about racism, it infuriates me. What's your reaction, Mary? Um, I, I talk about this in my thesis, I call it a presser-centered intervention. And it's the idea that like, I feel like a lot of art schools, their natural inclination is like, oh, we need more workshops, we need more resources to teach people how to not be racist. Um, we're giving so many more resources to these white people who continue to harm us and may never learn until like five more lifetimes, you know? But there are people of color who are really qualified, who are, who, who, who know about racism, who have experienced racism. They have racism informed pedagogy. And you don't have to teach them. You don't have to waste all these resources on them. And um, frankly, um, you know that you are anti-racist when you are anti-racist. Until that moment, you are creating harm. Um, and I feel like a lot of white um, professors and staff have to really come to terms with like the fact that they don't know everything and that they may know nothing about racism. We have a comment here from FD. They're saying, I'm scared of being the person of color token in my art program this fall. Lauren, what would you say to that? I would say um, it's a valid fear, but you have to ignore those labels. Um, you are who you say you are. Uh, don't worry about whatever is projected onto you because you're there to learn for you and you're there to make the art that you want. Um, because once you graduate, once you leave uh, art school, you're not gonna have these professors, you're not gonna have the administration or students talking about your work. It's going to be you and maybe like the network that you find. So don't worry about um, those labels and just do what you need to do. Yeah, and you guys are up against a lot because I'll tell you that in addition to art history, there's also this concern about alums of these institutions. So for example, there are some alums that certain schools love to talk about. I mean, how many times have we heard RISD say, Seth McFarlane, he made it family guy. He went, we're like, yes, we know he went to RISD. This is pretty clear. How many times have we heard about Shepherd Ferry how many times have we been talked to about the Airbnb guys who went to RISD and Gus Van Sant, who was a, well, still is obviously a Hollywood director, directed major films and everything. And it frustrates me because I'm like, look at all the alums that you have coming out of your institution. And these are the 
only people you can push. I'm like, dude, we have Hama, I can't pronounce their last name, Baba. We've got Julie Meritu. We have Kara Walker, Shazi Sikandar. These are all alums from the exact same school. And yet, how often are we talking about the alums who are women of color compared to say the Airbnb guys? I mean, I know from a faculty perspective, I'm looking at it a little bit differently because I get different information from the school than say a student does. But Lauren, what's been your impression about the way a school pushes or does not push their alums? So it's very weird. It's And it's a really weird relationship with um, artists of color who graduate. Uh, oftentimes they're not really pushed. You don't really hear about them. Um, I think the only artist of color that I heard of was Kara Walker. Um, but I actually learned that there were many more like women of color artists who graduated from the school. Um, and I think that a lot of the times uh, alums walk away from RISD uh, feeling like this school really uh, stressed me out. Uh, but RISD continues to push them and say, oh, well, we had them. and you know, um, they were amazing. And all the while they walked away with a very traumatizing experience. Right, and it's it's so disappointing because, okay, Shazia Sikander, I love her because first of all, she's incredible work, really contemporary, but it says a lot about her own culture and background as an artist. She's really succinct, she's a great speaker which is not always the case. Oftentimes people are great artists and they're just not very good public speakers. She's incredibly articulate. And she won, I think it was some national arts medal. It's like they give it, like you actually go to the White House and you get, it's like one of the top awards. She won a MacArthur Foundation grant. I mean, it's like, it does not get better than that in terms of being an artist. I mean, Kara Walker won a MacArthur when she was 28. And why are we still talking about Seth MacFarlane? I'm like, great, he does fart jokes and he makes movies about teddy bears that talk. Really? Fine, he makes $15 million a year, but I'm not impressed by that. I would much rather say that I'm actually doing something for the good of the community. And Shepherd's Ferry, which by the way, we have a stream about this, that actually it's very common that when you get very famous images that are of people of color, so much of the time they're made by white artists. And Shepard Ferry is an example of that because Shepard Ferry is so well known for that Obama poster that he did in 2008, everybody's seen it, and yet he's a white male. And so all this alumni stuff just infuriates me. What's your take, Mary? Um, well, I, I honestly don't really pay attention to the alumni that much. It's just like, I know that Shepard Ferry and stuff went to RISD, but um, I just like constantly look for women of color. And it's like women of color achieve this like success, not saying that you have to be successful, but they achieve all this like against all odds. And like almost all of my friends, like femmes of color around me at RISC were sexually harassed like during during the art school experience and um I just feel like you are at odds with racism sexism violence all the time and like they have MacArthur genius grants and stuff like that it's just like incredible we have a comment here from Tori. They're saying, I didn't know Kara Walker went to RISD until this very moment. I literally only hear about Seth MacFarlane being an alum. And Eileen is saying, it makes me think that RISD only highlights alumni that have donated money to them. That is definitely the case when you think about the people that started Airbnb. They're billionaires. Of course, they're more interesting than all the women of color. I mean, come on. It's just, yeah, a lot of it has to do with money. But I would think as a school, you would be proud of these women of color and that you would wanna show the world that you're a part of their development as an artist. And I just find it incredibly depressing to think about it that way. Let's talk about Mary and Lauren, some possible, I don't wanna say solutions, maybe more initiatives that people can take. What could one person do? Because I know for some people, the topic is so big that a lot of people say, I'm one person, what can I do? 
So what are some actionable things that people can do to help this? What do you think, Mary? Um, it's interesting because a lot of people in liberal spaces are talking about mindfulness and like happiness and stuff like that. But in reality, mindfulness is paying attention to how you feel about things around you, uh, being um, perceptive, like really like feeling those things inside of you. And everybody knows that racism is real. That is just a fact. You see it everywhere. Um, people a lot of times deny their instincts, don't allow themselves to feel like this pain. They like numb themselves to this pain. I would just say that like um, everybody has to be a little fearless, a little shameless, and really uh, be a part of this reality. And once you're a part of this reality, you'll know what to do. If you don't know what to do, read all these books by like mostly like black femmes of color, like Audre Lorde, Estelle Ellison, Sadia Hartman, like I can give you a whole list. Like they're incredible and like, I don't know, you guys are missing out if <laughs> you're not reading those books. Lauren, what are some other actionable things people can do to help? Um, I guess supporting artists of color, first and foremost, buying work from black artists, paying them. Um, a lot of, especially right now, I think a lot of artists of color are receiving like, ex I guess like are, are being elevated on these platforms all of a sudden, which is so overwhelming, but exposure doesn't pay the bills. So by supporting these artists, by donating to them, buying their work, it's super important to um, just let them know like your voice is important and to encourage them to keep going. Um, so that also means just being supportive and fighting more artists and doing that research as well. I really like that a lot, Lauren, because I think a lot of people, sometimes their first thought, and this is good too as well, is to donate to an organization that maybe supports people of color. And that is absolutely something that everybody can do for sure. But I'll tell you, there's something that happens when somebody buys your artwork that as an artist is really like special. It's like, I mean, Mary, have you had some, I know you're still in school obviously, but have you had people purchase your work in the past? Yeah, I love everybody who has gotten my work. It's like, I just have so much stuff in my house. Like I'd rather go to a home where someone loves it. And you build connections that way. And like certainly like buy work from like black and brown artists, buy work from people of color and um, adding on to Lauren's point in terms of sharing resources, I feel like a lot of people are like, Black Lives Matter, like I'm going to be anti-racist, but their anti-racism is only when it's convenient. Anti-racism is actually giving up your resources. Uh, equality means losing your privilege. It means sharing your wealth. It means like, like letting someone have your platform and like just like giving things away. You're not meant to be super rich. You're not meant to have all these resources. That is racism and you're hurting people by like being greedy about it. And so I just wanna like support Lauren and saying like donate to a lot of like black organizations, support black artists, actually give them resources. Like don't just do it when it's convenient, do it when you lose things. Like that's when real activism and anti-racism happens. Well, and there's a big difference between buying an artwork from a person of color artist versus, oh, I posted them on my Instagram. I mean, it's not bad to post it, on, but it's like anybody can post it on Instagram, but going through the effort to actually purchase a painting from a person, that to me has so much more weight and meaning than the whole, well, I'm exposing people to you. I mean, like you said, you can't feed yourself on exposure. We talked about this the other night on one of our streams here at Art Prof. Now, Lauren, what about schools? I know that's a much bigger can of worms, but what can schools do in terms of faculty? Because we've talked about the lack of people of color as faculty. Um, I guess beginning to cycle out, like there's this art school tradition of having that one like super strict, like usually white professor that is hard on everybody, but they're especially hard on students of color. And they hold these very antiquated, like just super old, outdated um, standards of what is good art. Um, and usually a lot of the time, um, artists of color do not meet up to those standards. 
And so beginning to cycle out and get getting rid of those professors and bringing in professors with more marginalized identities, professors of color, trans professors, queer professors um, is important. So a lot of these students who are coming in have somebody who look like them, has somebody who understands them and is able to accommodate to their needs and have, you know, give these students better advice uh, for when they exit these schools. For sure. I mean, that's one very concrete action that schools can definitely take. And it's a real problem. You guys have probably seen in some of my other streams, what is so common across the board is white faculty who hire their white spouses and partners and friends and family. And I'm like, look, it's not even on the radar. Like it doesn't even occur to them to hire a person of color. And so until that cycle changes, it's going to be hard to get people of color in those positions because that is what's happening everywhere. It's not specific to one school, it's systemic. It's a major problem. So very, very frustrating. Anyway, you guys, I would really encourage you to look at the RISD Anti-Racism Coalition on Instagram. They also have a website. You can go down to the video description below and find that link. And they also have, there's tons of information on this website. Mary, can you just tell people what's on the site? Yeah, on the website, um, we basically released demands for our our personal art school to change. Uh, we gave them very clear outlines and what kind of changes we want to see for anti-racism. Um, we asked all the departments to respond to us with letters and they are all on this website. Um, this was made by students like me and Lauren, it was led by Jada and Sarah. And um, we're all just real students who really are tired of racism and don't want more people to get hurt. And we're just, we just want this institution to change. Um, but yeah, everything on there is inspired by the recent protests. Um, we are really trying to uh, use the momentum right now to create real change and we'll see if that happens. Um, I also want to add something really quick to what Lauren said about cycling white professors out in terms of like uh, institutions like natural inclination to be like increased diversity to fix the problem. Um, and I really want to share this real quick quote by Angela Davis. I am not suggesting that diversity cannot do good work, but it has to be combined with justice. Diversity without structural transformation simply brings those who are previously excluded into a system as racist, as misogynist as it was before. And so these institutions can't just do superficial changes. They have to really change the heart of the institution or be dismantled with the rest of white supremacy. We have a comment here from Alyssa. The stream is so good and these conversations are so important. I'm glad Mary and Lauren are guests tonight. They know exactly what they're talking about. Thank you very much, Alyssa, for that comment. So sweet. And we also have a link to the RISD in Race forum panel that Mary and Lauren spoke on. It's on Vimeo. You guys can find the link in the video description below. And Artcroft has a podcast. You guys should check us out. We're on Spotify and also on iTunes. And we will be having our post live stream party over in the Art Prof Discord. The invite is in the video description below. And I believe Lauren is going to be in there with us. I think, Mary, we're going to try to get you in there as I'm well. I'm going to be there. Excellent. So we will all be in there and we're happy to continue the conversation because obviously, wow, there's a lot more to be talking about. And if you guys have ideas for other videos that perhaps are related in terms of content. We're all ears here at Art Prof because we want to really um, give visibility to these voices. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make everything possible here at Art Prof. They keep the lights on. And thank you so much to everybody who listened and contributed your comments to this stream. Thank you to Lauren and Mary for being guest artists on this stream. Everybody stay safe. We will see you next time. Bye.